Good day, Kara. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Uh, I've been following you for about three or four years via social media, and it's only just over a little, little over a week ago that we met face-to-face -face on Skype. Um, but for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us where you live, where you work, what you're currently doing, and perhaps go back to some of the more interesting things you've worked on in your career? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. Well, Guy, thank you again for the opportunity. I followed you for a while, obviously, back, and I've really always kind of admired a lot of the stuff that you've, you've put out there. So it's just been a real delight just to get to know you a little bit better. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Kara North, and that's Kara, C-A-R-A. -A. Um, I don't know why my parents spelled it that way. Maybe they wanted to torture me. I'm not sure. A lot of times you get called Clara or Carla, but whatever. As long as you're close to Kara, I can I can roll with it. Um, I currently live in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm a learning experience designer at the Ohio State University. Now, um, going way back into the time machine, just to kind of explain how I got to where I am, uh, like many people in the industry, um, I fell into this profession. I did not go to school or didn't really have any aspirations to be in learning and development. Um, originally, I wanted to actually be like my mom. Uh, my mom worked for the U.S. Department of Agriculture for 37 years, and government work was a great career choice for her. And, um, you know, I always respected my mom's career and always looked up to my mom. So I wanted to be like her. So I thought, you know, maybe I can go to college and then get a some kind of a job in the government sector when, when I decided to go. So um, I ended up going to undergrad at the University of Kentucky. Kentucky Go Wildcats, and I got a degree in broadcast journalism, and um, you have to kind of, I guess, to, to go back just a little bit, um, I wanted at, at an early age to actually be a doctor, and I actually uh, specifically wanted to be a neurosurgeon for a very long time, um, because uh, when I was younger, I was involved in a pretty a traumatic horse accident when I was nine years old, and um, it came very close to ending my life, ended up having a few seizures, and, you know, I really thought a lot of, like, my neurosurgeon, I mean, he really, I mean, pretty much, like, you know, really kind of helped save my life, essentially, and I really wanted to go in the medical route, but then when I went to high school, I had discovered chemistry, and uh, it just wasn't my jam, and then I thought, oh my goodness, I kind of had this before quarter life crisis, if you will, trying to figure out what do I need to do with my life, and I really thought, you know, I really like creativity, I like writing, I like storytelling, and so that's how I kind of ended up uh, going down the pathway of journalism, so I went to the University of Kentucky I got my degree there in broadcast journalism, and um, I'm the first person in my family to graduate college, so my parents were very proud of me and my accomplishment, but for myself, I was really disappointed in myself and took it pretty hard that I couldn't get a good full-time job after I graduated undergrad, so I did what a lot of people did. I moved back in with my family in eastern Kentucky, and uh, I became part of that boomerang generation, if you will, and I wanted a job. Like, I was just, I, I wanted a job. I didn't care what it was at that point. I just wanted to be doing something besides sitting at home and feeling sorry for myself. And I remember the newspaper that um, mom and dad got at the house actually had a um, help wanted ad in the newspaper, okay? Like, so, yeah, actually a help wanted ad in the newspaper. Oh, yeah, old school, right? Um, saying that there were open interviews for this call center in Huntington, West Virginia, which was, like, right across the border from where uh, my parents were. And I thought, well, you know, that beats zero dollars an hour. So I went to the unemployment office and had a, an on-site job interview, and I got the job. And I was thrilled to just have a job at that time. So I went to work for that call center, and it was pretty tedious work. Um, if you've never worked in a call center, please be nice to the people on the phones. It's grueling work, and um, it really gave me a new appreciation for just the customer service industry in general. Um, I hated it, but again, it beat me. So um, again, firm believer that whatever job that you have, regardless of what it is, there's some kind of experience or transferable skills that you can get from that experience to make you a better person. So I like to think that because of that role, I'm a little bit better in customer 
service, hopefully, but um, I digress. Anyway, um, so I worked there for about two to three months, and they said, oh, hey, like, you are professional, you come to work on time, and you can also fog a mirror, we want to promote you. I was like, oh, me? Um, So I ended up getting promoted pretty quickly into a role called a call center quality analyst, and in that particular role, I was able to coach the folks that were on the phone through, like, the script, because it was political fundraising, so there was a pretty tedious script they had to follow, and one tiny, tiny, tiny little element of that is I got to train the new hires, because most call centers are revolving doors of people, there's constantly some class of new people coming in, about the procedures of the call center, and I thought, huh, training, I was like, that's kind of, that's kind of cool, you know, and I didn't have any set curricula, like, I had the standards of the, the call center, and I asked somebody, I said, well, what do I need to train on? And they said, oh, you know, whatever you think is right. And I was like, what? I have creative uh-huh. freedom here? Like, I, I mean, I really got excited. And so I remember um, after the first time that I did my little training, I remember walking away from that training room. And I really kind of had this vision. I was like, this is this is what I want to do. Like, I just, it just clicked with me. And I just absolutely fell in love with it at, at that moment. And, and I thought, you know, weird just how life works that here I thought I was supposed to do this one path and then you know I took a risk taking a job many people probably would stick their nose up in the air at but again it beats nothing and then it led me to this it's just it's so clandestine just kind of the way that things happen so after working there for about a year right across the mountain uh ended up being another call center for a company that you may or may not have heard of called amazon.com and what What's happening was a lot of the people that worked at that particular call center ended up going over to Amazon. And as they were going over to Amazon, I stayed in contact with them. And they actually were kind enough to recommend me to come over to Amazon as well. They made comments like, you know, Kara is a great uh, trainer. She would be great. You guys need to pick her up. So long story short, I was really heavily recruited. And I ended up accepting an offer to come over to Amazon.com. And that was in 2000 nine um uh, which gosh that just seemed that was 10 years ago which is it, crazy to think about um it was a really exciting time to work at amazon then um i started in the kindle department and that was uh really i mean it was just amazing just to see how quick that product line grew um at that time it was like the second generation kindle was what they were using and um it was it was just a really wild time and i really learned a lot um, starting out, but then one day I had a comment that I had to ask my manager um, because we actually released a new version of Kindle, and up to that point, the first two Kindles had uh, Wi-Fi and 3G capabilities, 3G capabilities, meaning that obviously you don't have to connect to a Wi-Fi connection in order to download books. Well, what happened in uh, one of the holiday seasons, I believe it was maybe 2010, hard to remember, um, but they switched to where they had a Wi-Fi only Kindle. And so what happened is the price of the Kindle went down $100. And so, of course, that, that uh, helped the numbers for the sales. But what people failed to realize, and these were people buying uh, Kindles for loved ones, and a lot of times they were previous Kindle owners, that this did not have that 3G capability. So what happened was at, on the customer service side, we got inundated with so many customer contacts about what's my Wi-Fi password. It keeps asking me for a password, Amazon. You need to know my Wi-Fi password. And our associates weren't ready for that. I mean, straight up, they, they were not ready to to, to handle that, that, um, that kind of contact because that was something that they didn't really necessarily plan for. So I made a comment to my manager at the time. Um, about our training materials, I said, who makes this? I was like, it, it's really outdated. Like, this is not cutting the mustard of what people are needing. And he said, oh, yeah, that's actually the instructional design department. And, um, yeah, they're, they're pretty pretty heavily worked, and they could probably use some help. And I heard a whisper that they might be having a job opening. Is that something you'd be interested in? I said, sure. And so a month later, that's how I became an instructional designer at Amazon, and 
What a wild ride that was. Um, at the time, the learning management system we had was Moodle, if you can believe it. And um, I got to do a bunch of really neat things in that role. Um, I started my love-hate relationship with learning management systems in that role. Um, I um, had the opportunity to work with people all across the world. Uh, I had uh, friends I made in Costa Rica and the Philippines that were trainers of those particular sites and they would email me needing help to like set up their course and get materials. Um, I really got kind of a, a school of hard rocks education about setting up a training guides facilitator. I did my first like train the trainer at Amazon and I really started uh, my journey into e-learning even though then at that time I didn't even have an e-learning authoring tool. E-learning for me was I built it directly in the learning management system in pages and I would use different graphics and man I thought I was something you know um, that was I really thought I, w I was doing well so I, I'm really grateful for, for the time that I had there and I can't imagine having a better place to work and kind of get my formative years of experience if you will out of that. Now with that being said um, I missed being in a training room really bad. I missed uh, that interaction, and I just didn't feel like my professional development tank, if you will, was was full. So um, I actually ended up, in addition to doing stuff at Amazon, I ended up started working at an adult education center in Huntington, West Virginia, in the evenings, teaching adults about um, resume, workforce development skills, basic computer skills. Um, for the state of West Virginia, um, in order to receive public assistance, uh, you have to do a uh, work activity. So that can mean work part-time or go to this class. And this class, this company I was working for was a subcontractor for the Department of Health and Human Resources. So this was kind of, in lieu of like working, this was a mandated work activity that they could go to in order to, um, you know, earn their public assistance. And I loved that job. Man, I love that job. That was that was a wild ride. And you want to talk about some crazy stories? There were just some amazing, good-hearted people that I got to meet in that role. And my favorite part was seeing that just the delight in their eyes of just learning how to use a computer or, you know, hey, Kara, I got a job at McDonald's. Like, this is a big deal. Like, this is a step in the right direction for me. Gosh, it was, that was so gratifying, um, and I really enjoyed my time there. But with that being said, fast forward to 2013, uh, while all this is happening, and um, I end up falling in love with a guy in Ohio uh, in the middle of all of this. And um, usually when you're in love, you might have a set of rose-colored glasses on. And so, um, you know, I made the decision to leave my, my job and then move here to Columbus to be with my now husband. So it ended up, it's a, it's a happy story. Ended up working out, working out well. And when I moved to Columbus, um, I really struggled trying to figure out where I needed to go to work at. I obviously loved kind of that corporate L and D aspect of it. So I did have an interview with a company here in town to be an ID. And then I also had an interview at Ohio state and that was uh, managing uh, and working in their call center for facilities management. And you can imagine one offered a higher salary than the other. But really what swayed me to Ohio State was I remember basically in my interview, I asked about the benefits package. And the guy that ended up being my boss, he said, well, I know that you're probably going to get offered more money somewhere else. But he said, we have free tuition and you can go to school for free. That was it. Sign me up. Because, again, I did not originally go to school for instructional design, right? And I wanted to backfill kind of my credentials in that way. And um, what a delight. I mean, how lucky am I to work somewhere that offers that as a benefit? So I started working at Ohio State in 2013. Uh, by 2015, I earned my master's in workforce development, and I'm currently a student in the PhD program of, for learning technology, and I hopefully, fingers crossed, if I can keep my um, stuff together, I should be done by 2020 with my doctorate. That's very, very cool. Great story. It, circuitous route to uh, into this is, uh, as most people uh, experience, I think. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your first exposure to what 
some call HPT, human performance technology, and others call it evidence-based practice and human performance improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you came to that. Sure. Um, I remember the first book of the industry that I received as an instructional designer at Amazon is our uh, boss at the time actually bought us all the ATD book Telling 8 training. The book was really, again, eye-opening for me because I really thought a little bit more heavily about why I'm doing what I'm doing. What is the purpose of how I'm explaining content? What is the purpose of the performance? how does all of that fit together because again I kind of came in through this meandering path and for the most part at that time in my department all of us IDs we were promoted from within the company um, so we ha our manager did have I think formal training in um, instructional design and organizational development I believe but um, you know we really all learned together through that and that book really kind of opened it up for me specifically, it's like, okay, so this isn't just about me being a sage on the stage. Like, it's about me facilitating. So, Kara, who or what else were your other influences in this human performance technology besides the Telling Aid training book from Stolovich and Keeps? Are there other articles or books or people that uh, you were exposed to that uh, taught you more? Great question. Um, also, uh, through that, I learned about the e-learning guild, and I learned about um, ATD through my exposure to those books. And through ATD, I got an old copy of one of those big ATD handbooks. And I remember flipping through a couple of those, and there were some people that stood out to me. One was uh, Clark Quinn, and then Dr. Michael Allen uh, wrote a lot of great things about just how to approach just design and, and learning. And one thing that Michael Allen said, and I don't know if it was in that particular one, but something that's always stuck with me is, you know, boring is bad. <laughs> and, and that, you know, we shouldn't strive to be mediocre or boring. And that just always resonated with me. And I really enjoyed um, that he said that. So those are kind of the two big ones that I do remember kind of flipping through. And then after um, I got my first e-learning authoring tool, which was um, actually Articulate Storyline, um, I, uh, you know, got on kind of the forums with that. And that's how I learned about this guy named Mike Taylor, who um, always shared just great things about just storyline in general and tips and tricks. And I just loved his approach of just how to build things a little bit more engaging. Very cool. Let's segue to um, my next question uh, to provide an example for others. If, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, how, how do you present that to uh, people? I help unlock the superhero cape of knowledge for people. So if you want to get better at whatever it is that you're doing, I partner with faculty, teachers, subject matter experts to take all of your content knowledge, process it in a way that is distributable to other people to help them get better at what they do. As a lifelong learner, where are you currently focused? I know you're in a PhD program, but are it, can you talk to us a little bit about that and what you're learning or uh, your folk? I know you're focused in your multi-focused or foci, I guess is what you have, um, learning and writing. And you're very, very involved in lots of uh, uh, things going on in the field. Talk to us a little bit about that and what, where, where you're kind of uh, uh, looking as a lifelong learner to explore. I guess I just have an unquenchable thirst guy. I mean, I always want to stick my nose in something and read a little bit more about it. Um, I learned a, a trick from Mike Taylor, who I actually got to meet when I moved to Columbus, which blew my mind. Um, but that's a whole other story maybe for a little bit later about just the importance of reading every day. And um, one thing that he taught me was about, you know, going through the Internet, curating, reading things that you like. And then instead of just like reflecting on it and say, oh, yeah, that's really cool. 
sharing it with others. And so that's one thing that is really important to me on LinkedIn as well as Twitter is to share all the great things that I find because, again, I believe a high tide raises all boats and we can all kind of grow and learn together. Now, as far as my PhD program, I am all over the place. There's just way too many things for me to explore and I really got to make a decision sooner than later because I am hoping to do candidacy next spring. Um, I'm really torn between the standards of instructional design Um, and when I say that I mean and this is something that you know Dr. Don Snyder talks about a lot is like what does good look like? Um, Good at Amazon looks a whole lot different than good at Ohio State. And I don't mean that to be disrespectful at all. It's just a different way of looking at it. And there have been these competency models um, come out through like ATD about like, you know, the L&D competency model. I don't know if that's necessarily enough because assessment, that's very nebulous. Instructional design, that's very nebulous. Training delivery, that's very nebulous. There's a lot of things that just kind of depends on a lot of different factors. I was actually having this conversation with uh, somebody at work a little bit earlier today that, you know, it's not that, it's not that I don't think that instructional design practitioners want to grow, but I think a lot of times they're just so overwhelmed by everything that is in the job descriptions today. If you pick up a job description at Ohio State for an instructional designer and pick it up at the widget company, they're going to look totally different. And if you read everything that they want for somebody to do, it's crazy. I mean, in my mind, there's no way that somebody can be an expert in all of that. And so that's something that I know and I admit, uh, but the nice thing is I like to think that maybe if I don't know something that I have networked and I've gotten to know a lot of great people in in this profession. And one thing that I've learned, especially in the past year, is I feel like the deeper you go in this profession, the smaller it gets. And um, it's just really cool just to see all the expertise and how willing people are to share their ideas uh, with you on either social media or um, just a quick email or a Skype call. Um, you know, it's really really fantastic to be a part of that community. So with that being said, another kind of research interest of mine is how do we as practitioners share knowledge via social media? Now, if you look in the research and literature, there's a lot of stuff out there about teachers, how teachers use PLNs, how teachers use Twitter, how teachers use LinkedIn, etc. Not a whole lot out there about us. I guess we're a motley crew. I don't know. So we had this discussion about if teachers and instructional designers were the same. And I have the mentality that they're not because currently, as you know, um, teachers, at least in the United States, have to have some kind of a formal degree, some kind of licensure, and some kind of professional development hours that they must maintain in order to educate the youth of America. Whereas instructional designers... You could be a kid that just graduated, undergrad, in the recession, have no idea what you want to do in your life, and you can be an instructional designer at a Fortune 50 company in two years without a formal degree. Now, I, I, you know, I, when I brought that up, he couldn't believe it. And what's really interesting, guys, if you look at um, instructional design positions at universities, I'm seeing more and more universities that want someone with a PhD to an yeah. instructional design to be an instructional designer. And I'm like, what? Like, y- you can walk into many companies nowadays without that, if you have a good portfolio and have good evidence that you can make an impact on performance, you can be an instructional designer, I feel like, anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's so true. I, it's my experience as well, but we don't need to go into that. Um, so one of the questions that I ask people about uh, is about a favorite HPT or evidence-based practice term or phrase that they would like to talk about. Perhaps they feel that people are misusing it or it's a a phrase that people need to pay more attention to and you would like to share with us what that phrase is and your take on it, your meaning for it. Do you have one for us? um, Wow. I could probably come up with a couple. I think a big one for me, um, especially because I've been presenting on it a lot lately, is engagement. Um, What does learner engagement look like? Like, How are you engaged with the content? 
it's not easy um, to define it. Actually, if you go into a lot of the uh, journals, there's not a hard definition of learner engagement. There's several different constructs of it, and that's kind of what I want to focus on in this kind of Kara definition, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's kind of three different constructs of it. So there is like the cognitive engagement. So how are they acting with the content? Is it something that they are studying? Is it something that they have practiced for mastery? What does that look like? So another construct would be behavioral engagement. So this is how somebody is interacting with uh, the course. It's how it's interacting with the trainer. And um, I have a friend, her name is Joe Cook, and she's written about digital, saying that you can also kind of measure this engagement through online interactions, through kind of your digital footprint of if they're um, speaking in the comments, if how long the time on task they are on the different pages, et cetera. And then the third would be the emotional engagement. So how they feel in the course, how do they feel amongst their peers? Do they feel like they can learn together? Can they work together toward a common good? Um, can is, is there a mentoring program, et cetera? So for me, that's what engagement is about. Engagement isn't about focusing on somebody's generation. Um, that is a big pet peeve of mine. As a card-carrying millennial, you do not have to cater to me because like everyone else on the planet, I'm a unique individual and I will not be stereotyped. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, as we discussed earlier uh, in our prior Skype call, I wanted uh, to ask you to share some stories of others that have been influential in your life. And you've, you've uh, indicated as we start, before we started this particular call that you have three people that you would like to uh, tell, share with us something about them. And what I was looking for was either humorous stories or human interest stories or something that makes these three individuals um, more human, and perhaps uh, they will be people that others choose to begin to follow. But uh, you told me that Clark Quinn was uh, one of the people that you were going to tell us a story about. Yeah, I met Clark back in 2017 um, at the Association for Education, Communications, and Technology Conference in Jacksonville, Florida. And for me, um, again, full transparency, that was my first kind of pure higher ed conference. And after being in corporate L&D conferences and, and been there and see kind of the production value, I was extremely disappointed in that conference overall, just with the level of presentations, the level of what I felt was practitioner impact. It was all about the research, which now I understand that that's kind of the MO of that conference, and I understand that more. But I mean, I was like a deflated balloon walking around that conference. I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. I had like a little semi breakdown with uh, my roommate that stayed with me at the conference. I was like, I, why am I doing this PhD? This is this is not my crowd. These aren't my people. And um, it was time for the keynote, so I just kind of sulk and you know walk in, and I'm, you know I wasn't paying any attention. And then it was just like this beaming light, like. And then Clark Quinn sat down in front of me and I'm like looking around and I was like, hey, oh my gosh, guys, that's Clark Quinn. My friends are like, who? And I was like, don't you talk to me. Like I was Clark <laughs> Quinn. And so I was like, literally, I feel kind of bad. I was like creeping kind of like really close like this um, because he was doing his like mind mapping that he does for Kenos. And I was just, I mean, I, I have no idea what was going on in that room, except my eyes were glued to that iPad he was working on. I mean, it was like I was hearing this magical symphony in my head, just playing this magical song. And my friend was like, are you going to say something? And I was like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything to him. Like, are you kidding me? It's Clark Quinn. He won't, he, you know. And she's like, just do it. She's like, it's, he's a guy. Just do it. So the minute the keynote stopped, like, I bounced out of that chair and, you know, he was, you know, getting up. Or not, he wasn't paying attention, I don't think. And, like, I was waiting for him as he's making his way at the aisle. And, I, you know, I was, I was like this, you know. And um, he starts walking. I said, uh, uh, it, it, excuse me, Mr. Quinn, Mr. Quinn. He's like, yes. And I was like, hi. And he's like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and then the nerves kind of left me. And then I introduced myself. And I said, you know, I'm a huge fan. I've been reading your stuff for a long time. And, oh, my gosh. 
What a nice guy. Um, I was just blown away by his kindness. Um, he's somebody that has been so good to me so far in my career, um, especially the last two years. I can't say enough good things about him. Um, I had him on the training, learning, development community. I asked him to be part of an instructional design playlist. He very graciously accepted. Uh, last year, I went to that same conference again in Kansas City. Uh, we went out for a barbecue together and shared a beer. It was it was amazing. Um, so, I mean, what a super, super nice guy. And then earlier in this year, um, I went to another conference that Julie Dirksen was the keynote. He introduced me to her before the conference, and he, he didn't have to do that. So, I mean, he, and he's all already asked me for learning solutions if there's anybody that I'd like to meet. So, I mean, he's definitely a white hat. Um, he's definitely paying it forward, and I'm very appreciative of him. He's a really good guy. Very cool. Very cool. And you have uh, you have something you would wish to share uh, with us about Mike Taylor? Yes. So Mike Taylor um, is just the bee's knees, if that's still a word to me. Uh, <laughs> I followed, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I followed his work when he was still at Articulate. And when I moved to Columbus, I went from a team of about 50 to 60 to a team of two when I was here at Ohio State. And I had a crisis, guy. Like, I thought that I was good in instructional design. And one piece of advice I would give anybody, especially if you're early in your career, network, network, network. I am so ashamed. And my time at Amazon, I lived under a rock. I didn't think I needed to network with anybody. But, again, I was very fortunate to have some great coworkers and a great supportive boss and team there. And I didn't realize it, again, until, you know, you leave it. In my first two years here in Columbus, um, I was a hermit. Uh, my husband, he's like, you know, it seems like he's a little bit of your sparkle. He's like, you know, you really need to figure this out. Because I was so kind of out of it, and I was looking for a professional home and professional community, I ended up stumbling upon Central Ohio ATD. And the first event that was on their homepage featured Mike Taylor, and I, I was freaking out. I said, oh, my gosh, could this be the Mike Taylor? And then when I went, sure enough, it was him, and I was just starstruck, and I was like, oh, my gosh, it's Mike Taylor. Well, I sat there, and I was actually able to keep my composure and not creep like I did poor Clark Quinn, so I'm sure, you know, he appreciated that. The one thing that Mike said really stuck with me. He said that um, based on Jane Hart's um, survey of the tools that – uh, people use for professional development. He said that that particular year, Twitter was the number one professional development tool for L&D. And I sat there and I said, bull. I was like, who wants to use Twitter? Like, what's up with Twitter? And he just kept telling uh, these stories about how you make connections with people, these opportunities. And so, you know, I'm sitting there and I signed up for Twitter in his session. And that was March of 2016. I do remember as my first Twitter. And um, I you know, went up afterwards, and I said, hi, I'm Kara, you know, and I said, I'm really intrigued by your process for curation and Twitter, and I said, you know, I can see that there's authenticity in what you're saying, so I want to be like you, and I want to do the same thing you're doing. He said, great. You know who my first follower on Twitter was? Was Mike Taylor, and after that, um, I spoke more to him about his process and how he does things, and so Mike Taylor taught me how to use Twitter for my brand my personal learning network, everything. And now today, Twitter is one of my lifebloods. I mean, I am so thankful for all the fantastic people I've met on Twitter. And the best part is when I go to a conference, I know I'm not alone because I'm going to run into somebody from Twitter. It's just been absolutely amazing. So Mike Taylor is a very humble guy. Um, he says that he owes me money for what I say about him, but he has 100% been a huge impact on my career and uh, just so giving and so kind with his knowledge about everything. Um, I really recommend if you don't know him, uh, feel free to reach out to him because he's, he's a great guy. Excellent. You're, that's so right. He offers so much on his, uh, every Friday he's offering something and I'm signed up to his email. <laughs> The third person you, that you said you were going to talk about is uh, uh, Don Snyder. 
So what can you share with us about Dawn? Yeah, so um, 2015, um, I finished my master's in workforce development here at the university. And even though the position that I was in was very kind to me, I was ready to do more L&D stuff. So I was kind of limited in that position I was previously in. Um, There was an opening for basically like a training assistant in the center at the university called the Center on Education and Training for Employment. And the job would be about basically helping with job and task analysis workshops. And after finishing my master's in workforce development, I had a couple human resource development classes. So I loved job and task analysis and I was ready to get my hands dirty, right? Um, So I applied and I went over for a panel interview and it was a gentleman who ended up being my boss and then uh, the director of the center. And then in the middle of those two people was Dawn Snyder. And man, she grilled me. She grilled me hard. That was probably the most intense job interview that I felt that I'd ever, ever had. And as I was leaving, you know, I called my husband. He said, how did it go? And I said, I don't have a chance. I said, there's this woman. And I said, she hated me. And I said, it's not, it, it's not. There, there's no chance. So you can imagine how surprised I was. A week later, they called and offered me offered me the job. And I was like, okay, cool. I, I'll come on over. Well, long story short, Dawn being the way that she is, she saw that, and she was right, I was overqualified for that position. And she really wanted to make it clear that just basically to kind of assess if I would be a fit, if I would be bored in a week, um, you know, that kind of thing. And as I got to know her better, oh, my gosh, the fact that she has so much experience in this industry, the fact that um, I could just listen to her talk all the time just about everything that she's experienced as a business owner and, um, you know, going through her PhD program. I, I'm just so fortunate as a mentor. And the crazy thing is, I only worked with her formally for three months. Um, and then she ended up going to another opportunity. And I remember, like, the, one of her last days there, I said, I don't want to lose contact with you. Like, you're, you're, it's just really something special. So it was really important for me to keep that connection because I knew I could learn a lot from her. And she was willing to give her time and talents to me. And fast forward to to today, she is one of my biggest mentors um, in the Columbus area. She's been so good to me. She's helped guide me, especially in the last year um, as I've taken over leadership of Central Ohio ATD. She's been very pivotal to me um, in kind of giving me guidance on these stretch assignments, if you will, um, to be a better leader. And I really look up to her and admire her. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for agreeing to participate in this Skype interview with me. Um, Do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience related to performance improvement or L&D, especially for people that are kind of new to the field? What what kind of guidance can you give them? My biggest guidance, and again, this is something I wish I would have taken uh, to heart sooner in my career, is network, network, network. You will find that even though it feels daunting, especially when you're a new designer, there's so many things to keep track of, uh, so many different uh, mistakes that you're afraid of making. There are so many people out there that have been in your exact shoes, have made the same mistakes, and probably goofed it up worse than you ever thought about. So feel free to reach out to those people. Um, Again, for the most part, I can only think of maybe a couple crab apples, but most everybody has just been absolutely lovely that I've dealt with online and um, via social media as far as connecting with people. So uh, feel free to put yourself out there. And also my second piece of advice is uh, feel free to work out loud too. Um, And when I say that, I mean, if you're working on a job aid, if you're working on um, an idea for a workshop or something, as long as it's not something proprietary, um, share it on LinkedIn, share it on Twitter. You'll find a lot of times people have a lot of great um, ideas to make it a little bit better. Um, I like to do that a lot of times when I'm working like on a new um, 
you know, presentation, I'll, I'll have like a kind of a trusted group of people that I like to share things with and get their feedback on it as I'm going through. But yeah, I mean, it, we're all in this together, right? I mean, I feel like if you're in this profession, you should be a professional learner, right? So I think it's really important to kind of put your money where your mouth is and continue to grow yourself. So you will not be that person 5, 10, 15 years from now saying, well, but I've always done it that way. Why would I need to change? Don't be that person. Thank you. That's excellent advice. Again, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Have a great day. Oh, thank you. You too.